Say amen if you're Luke 18 and 1. And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. Lord, go and place your Bibles down. Let's talk to Jesus right now. Lord, we love you. We need you more than we know. And God, is as, as the end times comes barreling down our lives, God, I pray that we become real, sincere people of prayer and seeking your face, God, and asking your will and your ways, God. Help me tonight to deliver this thought, God. I need your help. I can't do it without you. And I pray right now asking for it according to your word. And everybody said in Jesus' name. God bless you. You can be seated. Prayer is the disciplined refusal to act before God directs. The wonderful thing about prayer, I got a few things because I just want to take the plow to your mind. You've had a tough week and the days are getting shorter. Anybody notice that? <laughs> I just don't, I don't like it getting dark like this. I just, man, I'm just, we're children of the light, man. Like, give me some, give me some daylight. Prayer goes where we often cannot. A person may not allow us to talk to them about God, but they cannot keep us from talking to God about them. That's the power of prayer and intercession. <sighs> In our text, Jesus tells a story, basically, that it's necessary for his followers to pray constantly and to never quit. In fact, that's how the message Bible says it. If, my, if I were to let my life be taken over by what is urgent, I might very well never get around to what is essential. Some of you are caught in the urgent, and prayer, but prayer is essential. Have you ever heard about the Postal Service's dead letter department? Anybody ever heard of that? That's the place where mail goes when it's not clearly addressed or doesn't have enough postage and the sender's identity can't be figured out. There, the letter is opened, and it is examined for clues as to where the letter came from. If the return address can't be found, then the letter is destroyed. It never reaches its destination, and any requests made by the writer remain unanswered. But how about you? You got some prayer letters unanswered? Do you feel like maybe some of your prayers end up in some kind of dead prayer department? You were unspecific? Something happened where you You feel like your prayers never reached God. That maybe your prayers are lost somewhere in time and space. And so, Jesus wrote this and wanted this and stated this and applied this and gave us this to inspire you. Understand what He's talking about prayer, but prayer then wasn't what prayer was going to be. The veil wasn't rent. Oh, well, oh, their their prayers weren't like our prayers. He didn't have the Holy Ghost and fire. That the, the veil wasn't rent. The Spirit wasn't released. In other words. The priest had to get all dolled up and get ready to go into the, today. Oh, we can just go to God. 
And that's what he's talking about here. It's clear that we are taught to be specific in prayer. It's meant to help us realize what access we have to God and that there is no dead letter or dead prayer department. There's a praying amiss, but there's no dead prayer department. We have to be willing to seek God for answers to everything in life that we face. Now, well, God don't want to be bothered about that. Really? Anybody got any children? Is there just so, don't come to me with that? No. I want to know, which, what do you need? What's going on? What are you hurting for? What, what can I do? First Thessalonians tells us in 5.17 to pray without ceasing. And if you pay attention to Scripture, Jesus was approached to help out in a plethora of circumstances. Anybody ever run out of drinks at your wedding? You're scrambling around. Get someone to go to Walmart. Get some cases of water. Get some cases of Coke. You wouldn't do that. Oh, no, just run to Walmart. But yeah, here's this, this, this wedding going on, and they ran out of wine. Mary told him, whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. A lady with the issue of blood came to him. A centurion came to Jesus for a sick servant. A lady approached Jesus desperately for a sick daughter. Jesus answers the disciples' dilemma with a hungry crowd. Takes a few fish, blesses it, and feeds everybody. Many that came to him were healed. The blind, the lame, the mute, lepers, and possessed. Matthew 4, 23 and 24. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. And his fame went throughout all Syria. And they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with diverse diseases and torments and those which were possessed with devils, even those scary ones, and those which were lunatic and those that had palsy, and he healed them. We're taught to keep bringing these needs before God today. The veil was rent to give us access into the divine nature of God that we can pray for things and get answers, get healings, get deliverances, know what God's will is for us today. We're never to feel as if we're imposing. Let me digress, because here in our scripture lesson, Jesus is teaching and telling us to do the same thing. He sets up a situation here for us to notice a problem on purpose. Listen, when you read this, the problem, of course, is he's an unjust judge. He's a scoundrel. He feared not God, nor had any respect for people. He's a mean judge. He had power, he had authority, but he didn't care. But Jesus is talking about someone going to them continuously. Jesus is speaking of a human judge, and a rather cold, indifferent, heartless one at that, no doubt. It can be hard to knock on the door of such a person. Hard to really knock on the door of someone you know you're putting them out, especially to ask for something. So you knock on the door and you're asking, and you're not just asking, you're asking a mean person for something. You know, we all may like the Amazon dude or the pizza delivery guy coming to the door. But I get, or let's eat. But cold knock in the door is uncomfortable. And some of us, if you played baseball or something, went door to door with your little box of candy bars and learned that it's an awkward situation to cold knock a door and always wondering what kind of reception you're going to get. You knock on the door and you hear that barking dog, oh, Lord, Now I may not bother you, but someone almost sent me into a tailspin last night. I've been around all sorts of dogs, big dogs, giant. I got a big dog, a lot of dogs. 
But the only dog that ever bit me was a dots. And the last night, someone walked into the prayer meeting with two dots. And I'm like, aren't they cute? No. I acted like they were, but oh God, the only dog ever bit me was a Dotson. Here I am riding my trike, being Air Force Base, just kicking along. Oh, I, you remember stuff like this. And I look up, and this old lady opens her door. She's standing there in her morning gown and still got curlers in her head. And I look over because I hear the noise, and this little Dotson runs out, runs all the way up, bites me on the leg, and runs back in the house. I just started crying. You never know what's going on. You knock on the door and there's a dog there. And then there's those times you ring the doorbell and you don't hear anything. You Did the doorbell work? Do I need to ring it again? Come on. <laughs> if I ring it again, is it going to make him mad? How long is the acceptable interval between the first ring and the second ring? Now, am I the only one that's been down this road? Am I the only one that's been terrorized with these thoughts? Most of us have probably agreed that, it, especially if you've been in that situation, door knockers are far superior than doorbells. Having lived in England, it was absolutely wonderful that most people have door knockers. Bang, 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 bang. In fact, they're so wonderful. As a kid, I would sneak up to a door, tie some string on it, run around the corner and go, bam, 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 and watch them come to the door and nobody would be there. And they can't catch me because I'm already around the corner. <laughs> watch it from behind the tree. Bam, bam, bam. <laughs> yeah. Thank God for that. Because if anybody's lurking inside, you can hammer that thing hard enough where it wake the dead. They're going to hear that noise. But we have this parable where Jesus tells us about a woman constantly coming to this unjust judge asking for help. Now, Jesus doesn't tell us that she's literally knocking on the door. But he does tell us that she kept coming to him saying, avenge me of my adversary or grant me justice against my opponent. This woman's a widow. You have to understand I don't think Jesus says anything by happen chance. I think he's trying to paint a picture for us. Very likely, because she was a widow, lived in poverty. It was a male-dominated culture of that day, and she had no social standing of her own, and no right to file a complaint in court unless a man did it for her. The law of Israel said that judges were to take special pains to hear the complaints of people like this widow. Scriptures are very compassionate when it comes to the likes of her. In fact, the first chapter of Isaiah upholds this high ideal, and it says, learn to do well. Seek judgment, relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, and plead for the widow. Pretty sure this judge, this man, this representative knew, but it doesn't appear that he has applied the prophet's admonishment, or at least he hasn't recently. He's a tough customer. Some theologians speculate that he would have been a crook, a charlatan, a thoroughly corrupt person. He was really out just to make a buck. He'd been in the position long enough now to where he realized there's gain to be had in people's distress. And this woman had no money to pay him, so why regard her? Why help someone who can't do anything for me if there's no one else who had power and authority to help? Where could she go? Let me throw a commercial in here. How many folks around us desperately need salvation? But because we see no personal gain, we ignore the need. We have the power, we have the authority because we have the Holy Ghost, but we're too busy. We don't want to be bothered. What do I get out of it? Why would I knock on that door? Why would I teach a Bible study? Why would I? I'm doing well.
Are we the unjust judge to those around us? Everybody out there seeking, looking for something. Everybody has an empty spot. People aren't going crazy out there chasing new, new dot coms and all sorts of things and new apps to make people jobs. Everybody's running to and fro. They're seeking something. Can you imagine if we were who we're supposed to be that they would come knocking on our door? Because they realize, man, they got a piece we don't have. They they got this Jesus thing. And trust me, as days get darker and political things get worse and more and more things happen in line with prophecy, people are going to come knocking. What kind of judge will they find in you? Will a desperate sinner come to you or is your persona that they would just rather not? Back to our story, the judge sees no personal gain and ignores her. She can knock on the door forever as far as the judge is concerned. More than likely, he's a bureaucrat. More than likely, he's ascended to a level where he's involved in a lot of business and he's busy. Busy doing his own stuff. His life is more important than hers. Why would I stoop to worry about her needs? My life's too important to be bothered with the likes of her. My desk is piled high with paperwork and things to do. Why would I stop to take care of someone less fortunate? Everything across his desk needs his stamp of approval. And for the unjust judge, this lady... It's hard to be heard with all the business that he is involved in. His stuff is more important and it benefits his life. He's not too concerned with her. Tough to be heard over the sound of all the other things in this judge's life. This weak widow was facing an uphill battle, a struggle. And Jesus painted this picture like this on purpose. You need to hear me. I, we sit here today in America, and you really, some of you got needs, but eh, I got a need, but I'm good. I hope so. I hope so. Because here's this widow standing on the doorstep of an, of an unjust judge. She's done so repeatedly, and who does she think she is bugging me again? I said, no, last time, the time from before that time, what, what's going to take? Nothing. I'm not bothering with her. But she continues to pound on the door. As time goes and she continues day and night, the judge's resistance begins to falter. It's hard to sleep when you're laying in bed. You pull the pillow over your head. You glance out the window and your neighbor's lights come on and they're standing out there looking over across the street at your house knowing, oh, God, she's waking up my neighbors. Oh, that's the lady whose husband that's died. That's that poor widow again. Why doesn't he do something about her? The neighbors start questioning the judge when they see him. Hey, what's with this lady coming to your house all the time? <laughs> he starts getting the side eye from the neighbors. They're out there watering the grass. And finally, at some point, this judge admits, okay, <laughs> you've beat me down. The neighbors are piling on. My dog doesn't even like me anymore because it's having to bark all the time. He's pulling the pillow over his head. He's had enough. And he basically says, no, I fear. I have no fear of God nor respect anyone yet because this widow keeps bothering me. I will grant her justice so that she may not wear me out by continually coming. It literally says in Luke 18, if I get because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her lest by her continual coming she weary me. Now, 
Nothing really stands out in that sentence until you look it up. That word weary, little Joe, bonanza. <laughs> that Greek word translator is wear me out is an old sports term. It's actually a sports related term. It comes from the world of boxing. It's a, a pugilist statement. It means to give somebody a black eye. Now, it literally means to hit under the eye, to buffet or disable an antagonist, to tease or annoy and to accomplish, to subdue, keep under weary. Now, Jesus had a sense of humor. It's been a long time since I've done it. Maybe I need to do it again and just do that. Jesus has humor message that I haven't done in a while. He might be painting a bit of a comical picture here because the judge is afraid this widow might pop him with a right hook. She may come, if she may see me in the street and crack me. She, he's, hold up, hold on. I, I might want, I got neighbors on me. My dog ain't happy with me. My wife wants to divorce me, and I might get beat in the street by a lady. Can you imagine her giving him the handbag haymaker? You're not going to look good to those pals. He's going to have to acknowledge and intervene before this thing escalates any further. So she shows up again, but he's ready. He's thrown in the ignoring her towel. Yep. He didn't even go to bed that night. He sat up. He's dressed. He's hanging out, doing his thing. Even the dog's gone to bed, but he's sitting up waiting. Because when she comes this time, he's going to hear her. I believe that would have brought a smile to the face of Jesus' audience. The people he's telling the story to, because certainly they probably had their own whole stories dealing with the dreaded bureaucrats or the people that you have to go to when you have a need. Mm -hmm. But Jesus' point here is not how to succeed in government. He's only using the unjust judge as a severe example. Because he says, listen to what the unjust judge says. He wants you to pay attention here. He wants you to listen to the story, but he emphasizes, I want you to listen. Listen to what he did. Listen to what he said. Why? Will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry unto him day and night? Jesus isn't inviting anybody to start praying. He's already invited everybody to start praying. He's already done that. Jesus is saying, if the most lowest person on the totem pole, the most powerless widow you could imagine, who's at the very bottom of the world's pecking order, will go to the highest level she can go in her town. And he's the most corrupt, crooked judge to take her case day and night to be heard and get answered. Well, maybe you missed it. And will not our loving Father willingly listen to every plea and petition of our? Do you understand? Do you understand what happened there in, in this chapter? Do you understand what's going on? It, why, why, why don't you just look at the reflection of your prayer life next to this story, next to what's going on, and how, how many unanswered prayers, how many prayers have not been prayed? How many times have you just taken things lackadaisical, and here's this lady at the lowest of low points going to a person that didn't want to regard. God is saying, listen, you're the apple of my eye. I love you. I'm going to count. Come to me, all ye that are laden and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Your prayer isn't like going to that unjust judge. You're not like that lady at the bottom of the totem pole. You're not without someone to plead for you. Jesus pled for you. 
life and vibrancy comes into your prayer life and desire comes to pray when you realize who you're praying to. I still feel like I'm by myself in here. Oh, Souls Harbor, I'm talking about Souls Harbor needs to get a revival, a personal revival of prayer. You ought to pray and not faith. Oh, wait a minute. Let's get this clear. You're a believer, but you don't pray. Hold up. And I don't mean to embarrass you, but I'm going to everybody sit down. Raise your hand if you want revival in this church. Raise your hand if you want revival in your home, family. How many believe prayer matters? Raise your hand. Everybody put your hand down. Everybody stand up that was here by 7 o'clock for prayer. Oh. Oh. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, wait a minute. There's a little dishonesty in here, but go ahead and be seated. Look, I'm the watchman on the wall. Spiritually dead is because how, how can you be on life if you're not talking to the one who gives you life? Yet this lady, this lady, and trust me, there's many of them that exist. There's many of that have been through the eons of time. If you lack the days, it will take. You're basically telling God, you don't matter. You're telling every person that walks in here, prayer is not a big deal. If your ministry in here or you have a title in here or you want to be such and such in here, but you can't make it in time for prayer, you're leading and you're telling people to go astray that it don't matter. Because Jesus took the time to put a put a, a parable, a story like this in here. He's saying, wait a minute, folks. Prayer is important. Prayer is important. Prayer is important. You're not going to some unjust judge. You're not some low life. I've given you the Holy Ghost. I've given you the earnest of your inheritance. You ought to be running to the prayer room because of your neighbor. You ought to be running to your prayer room because of your children. You ought to be running to the prayer room just in case you've done something. You ain't there's nothing more selfish in the eyes of God than a prayerless saint because they're not even willing to pray for the lost. Now, now I've, I've gotten sideways with God. <laughs> I, just sometimes I felt in my, my mind and my past that he needed my help to know what to do. I know ain't none of you ever done that. <laughs> Thank God for patience and time to look back and go, oh, he was so much smarter than me. <laughs> Oh, someone sang a song, can't remember who it was. I thank God for unanswered prayer. I was praying so far off. I was praying to miss. I was so scared. Thank God that he didn't answer that one. Well, there's just as many unanswered as answered. And he didn't unanswer them or not answer them. He did answer them. Just not the way I thought. Are you hearing what I'm saying? There ought to be something that comes alive in you about prayer for, for any church, for any church to have revival. For any any church, any person have personal revival, it's going to take prayer. You don't get lit on fire unless you could connect it to the source of that fire. Are you hearing what I'm saying? When this church gets lit up with prayer and everybody starts showing up because we're now, now hold on. I get it. Some of you don't get off. I get, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking to those with all the time in the world, and you mosey on in here 10, 15 minutes after or just right at 7. There's a difference, folks. I promise you, if you invite me to your birthday party, I'm not going to come late. If I invite you to meet to dinner, I'm not going to come late. Or if I'm running out there, wait, why, why, why do we have so many persons in respect but we disrespect God. Can I get an amen? Are you still with me? Can we give the Lord a hand praise right now? Because if you think God is like that unjust judge, he's saying, no, I'm not. God is not like that unjust judge. He listens, he cares, 
He responds. He answers. Our prayers to God do not end up in a dead prayer department. Now, this doesn't mean we get whatever we pray for. And thank God for that unanswered prayer I was talking about. Often, a parent has to refuse a child the request because they know that what the child is actually asking for would hurt more than it would help. Right? I thoroughly believed as a child that chocolate cake was a fine meal. A glass of milk and chocolate cake when you're seven seems like I don't know that anything we put on a porcelain plate could be any better. I don't know where to get off with these peas and carrot stuff. Chocolate cake works. Pie. When you're a seven-year-old, you could that makes sense to you. And some of us are kind of seven in our spirit. It's all gimme, 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 and no, well, let's let's do what's best. <laughs> you see, the wonderful thing about God is He knows and we don't. We don't know what's gonna happen in the next hour, let alone next week, next month, or next year. Only God sees the whole, and therefore God knows what is really good for us in the long run. I know people, I, I myself, have had some things happen where I'm like, God, what are you doing? But I'm so thankful that I hold him as sovereign and I will not question him. That is why Jesus says we must never be discouraged in prayer. James lets us know in chapter 1, verse 6, but let him ask in faith. You can ask, but you got to ask in faith, not wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. That's why he actually asked at one point, Jesus asked if human faith will even be available or will stand or will be looking for him when he comes. So with a hint of sarcasm, you have to understand this poor widow came to him every now and then. She showed up on his door only on Sunday mornings. And she showed up when rent was due. No. The representation we're given is day and night. That's all the time. When you're connected to God, you'll never grow weary in prayer. Our faith will never falter if we have offered to God our prayers and requests with the added punctuation, nevertheless, your will be done. Did you hear that? How many are seeking the will of God? When you get involved in what he's doing, it's going to be exciting. It's going to be amazing. It, it can actually be just, just blow your mind awesome. Because prayer is not about changing the mind of God, but about opening our hearts to the will of God. James 5 and 16, confess your faults one to another. You know, let me say this. In other words, don't act like you're perfect and you got it sewed up. Pray one for another. You know, the pride is the only disease that makes everyone sick except for the person who has it. Pray for one another. Are you hearing me? That you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Not a right man, not a good man, a righteous man. Prayer is not getting God to see it our way, but getting us to see it God's way. Prayer gets us in on what God is doing. I want to be in on what he's doing. But what does this mean to us? How many remember when I taught on the prayer and how to pray? Your kingdom come, your will be done. That's what he taught us. It's about surrendering to God his perfect will and trusting that God loves us and has our best interest in mind. No matter how bad circumstances or how against our nature or will it might be, I trust that God knows better than I. One historic writer, Aristotle, said, Do we pray, O oh God, make me pure? Just not right now. 
<laughs> Are you hearing what I'm saying? Our failures in prayer are most often due to the fact that our aspirations are half-hearted. Oh, I want to be on fire for God. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's Monday. It's Thursday. I want to be on fire for God on Sundays. <laughs> In other words, we really haven't made up our minds. We haven't decided that I want his will to be my will. I want one will instead of being double-minded. Double-minded people don't accomplish things for God. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you, James 4 and 8. Cleanse your hands. Look at what you're doing. Look at what you're involved in. If you want to be on fire for God, look at what you're doing. Look what you're involved in. You sinners, purify your hearts. You have to understand, the heart's divided, you double-minded. James 1 and 8 lets us know that a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. It's like, Jesus, lead me, oh God, except in the direction I don't want to go. God, help me preach a great message. But I really don't want to sacrifice and go all in. God, I want to do great things for you. But you got to do it on Sunday. Because I got some other things I want to do. Or how about this? Save me, oh God, from the consequences of evil, but not from enjoying its pleasures. <laughs> Are you hearing me tonight? You see, if we pray that way instead of praying in Jesus' name, which means, which is means and is saying, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ. Not my will, but thy will be done. I'm praying in Jesus' name, whatever he wants, I want to be a part of. Whatever he's doing, I want to be involved in. God, I'm talking about real prayer. The reason some, some don't want to pray is they don't want to yield. Why would you talk to someone who's going to give you something to do? I want to be used, God. I just don't want to feel used. It's funny how our hobbies will use the life out of us. We'll look back how much money we spend on our hobbies. How much money we'll spend on food and places to live and all this kind of stuff. We turn around, I want to be used greatly of God. Well, why don't you talk to him about what you're doing? Isn't it funny? We, we, we don't want the sacrifice side of it. In Philippians, Paul tells us we're to seek to have the mind of Christ. So when we pray, we should ask God to reveal his mind to us. Anybody have a need in your life? Anybody know of a need? And I'm not talking new dresses and stuff or shoes or well, no, that's not fair. Look, if you don't if you need clothes, you need clothes. That's serious. Been there, done that. I remember as a teenager, I lost my father. I'd start buying my own clothes. It's funny. It's funny. I, I wanted to go to the mall and buy my clothes when Dad was alive, but Dad was gone. I was footing the bill. Came right here. I come right. <laughs> oh yeah. I was the pro wing special in high school. I might, I didn't care. You can wear the high dollar shoes. I'll still outrun you. Let's go. What am I saying? And I'm not trying to be too silly. I want you, Lord, there's a need. Teach me your mind. 
some people I hear him say, I don't even know if God's talking to me anymore. No, it's not the, it's not he's talking to you. are not talking to him, and you're not open to hear what he really wants to say to you. You've pulled sacrifice and yielding off the table long ago. Why? You ever talk to someone and they don't respond? You ever text someone and they don't respond? What do you do? You stop. Teach me how to pray about this, God. Lord, I seek your face. Not my will, but thy will be done. Let me, give, let me pose a question to you, and I'm going to be quick here. Suppose you're in a rowboat. Someone asked me the other day about something about faith or something like that, and I said, faith and works are like the oars of a rowboat. If you only have one, you're going to spin in circles, but if they both work together... That was free. But anyway, so you're in a rowboat. You're about 15, 20 feet from shore. Okay? You want to pull the rowboat in, but you can't get out because of the situation. So you throw your anchor there. You pull yourself to the, to the shore. Let me ask you this question. Did you pull the land to you, or did you pull yourself to the land? I really don't need you to answer that. But that's how prayer works. It brings you closer to God. It's about the closeness. Prayer is about closeness. He looks into our hearts and he knows how distant we are. And actions speak louder than words. You need, you could say all you want. You could sit there and say his name. But he, and he said, you can do many wonderful works. But those are what you want to do. But your heart is far. What's he saying? It's time for some of us. We're, we're a little distant from the shoreline of Jesus. To throw that anchor and start pulling. I got to get back. I got to get in prayer and get closer to God. I got to get back. Closer. Man, I've drifted. I'm slipping. Church has lost its zeal. And I don't care if I pray. Reading the Bible is just drying it. I don't care about my neighbors or my, my church family. Or not. I'd rather gossip than, than use prayer time for praying. I, I'd rather. Let me pull on it. Let me get myself. Uh, it's about closeness, not just needs. If your heart's divided, if your affections and true allegiance is divided, you're really not going to pray or see the value in it. Let me tell you, when you come to this church and it's prayer time, go and go sit by someone that wants to talk. I'll say that about worship. Don't sit next to someone that won't worship. You can love, I love you, but listen, this is my time with Jesus. Uh, hold on now, I'm not being offended, but you know what the time is. Don't be talking during prayer. Seek the face of God, because every one of those times will stand in judgment against you. Don't cause someone to go to hell because you're indifferent to prayer time. And remember, let's be honest, some people's only prayer time is at church. Some of the time, the only Bible they hear is at church. Sometimes the only inspiration they get is at church. So when we come in here, and I don't care if the oldest or the youngest, it's prayer time. And when it's worship time, it's worship time. And when it's preaching time, it's preaching time. And when it's all time, it's, when it's, all, it's altar time. Because once we stop having an altar, once we stop having that sound, remember the ding, ding, ding at the checkout? The store can close down if it don't get that sound. If the church doesn't have that sound, that evidence, that response, the result of prayer, it's all over. Shut it down. Where are my prayer people at right now? Where are my prayers and Dr. Fainers tonight? Where are those folks that, you know what, Pastor? I'm with you, Jesus, right now. This is going to be a house of prayer. I'm going to get prayer. My home's going to be a house of prayer. We're getting ready for the second coming of Jesus. You better get a prayer life. You better get a prayer life about you. He asked, when the Son of Man come, will there be faith? Look, without prayer, there ain't no faith. Are you hearing me? When you get that one mind in accord with God, when you get close. See, the bad thing about, and this is why God did it. Men, men aren't meant to be perfect, but they're supposed to kind of understand. I know when I'm close to God and I'm not. Just like I know when I'm close to my wife and I'm not. Just like I know when I'm close to you and I'm not. That comes a little distance and that struggle or something happens and 
And sadly, I can kind of tell how some people are with God. It's just, it comes with the, the territory. James gives us a beautiful opportunity of that robo. Draw nigh to God. He'll draw nigh to you. Is a means whereby we are brought closer to the mind of God. Paul learned how to pray. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, we pray, God, I have a thorn in my flesh. Three times Paul went to God and asked to be healed. And there in the presence of God, Paul sought the mind of Christ. He quit asking to be healed and started asking for the strength to bear the affliction for the glory of God. God answered Paul's prayer. Let me say it this way. Paul said, to keep me from becoming conceited, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Let me tell you something. When he said, when he understood that God's grace was sufficient, for my power is made perfect in weakness, for when I'm weak, then I'm strong. Can I tell you what that is? That's freedom. That is answered prayer. It's power. That's how to become stronger through prayer. See, see, when you get to that place of God, I don't care who rises up against you. I don't care who, let me tell you, as a pastor, you, you know, people are going to oppose you over some people that should be with you oppose you. But when you're walking to God, okay, go ahead. Go ahead, Cora. Go ahead. Go ahead, big shot. Go ahead. I want the relationship with God that the whole world could be against me, but I'm good with God being for me. It's a good place to be. It's a good place to be, even if you've messed up. Go read your Bible, how many guys messed up? Noah messed up, but yet Nineveh repented. He was ticked off about Nineveh repented, but my God, pretty good preacher. <laughs> Let's all stand. There's a little boy. He knelt down beside his bed to say his bedtime prayers. His daddy heard him reciting the alphabet in very reverent tones. Layla, he was like, A, B, C. His dad looked down on him and said, son, what are you doing? Dad, I'm saying my prayers, but I can't think of the exact word tonight, so I'm just giving him all the letters. In prayer, we're seeking God's will. It's so important. I can honestly tell you, if it wasn't for prayer and that silent time to be with God all alone, I, I'm talking to you as just another, another, another person right now. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for those times. I'm not some person that's found some spiritual plane above everybody else. No. I think the only difference is I probably had farther to crawl than most of you. And I'm so appreciative of God hearing from me and wanting to hear from me. In prayer, we're seeking the will of God. So are we asking God to take our minds and make them more like God's mind? Are, are we willing to do his will? If you got the Holy Ghost, are you asking God... Are you asking the Holy Spirit to pray through you? Romans 8, 26, Paul, of all people, he said this, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. That lets us know we don't always know what to pray. We need the Holy Ghost. I wonder how many of us will be lost because we don't allow the Holy Ghost to pray through us. I wonder how many of us have infirmities and sicknesses and maybe distances and coldness. If we just have not yielded to God. 
Are we trusting that God has our best interest in mind? Maybe the enemy's tricked you, and deceived you, and you no longer believe or trust. And I know that it's not always easy in some scary situations. I've been there. But it can, done, it can be done if we will seek the Lord. If we will come into this house and sincerely seek the face of God. Don't, don't just get in your car and drive here to find where you always sit. And then get upset if you show up and someone's sitting in your spot. Move. It's not like we're packed. Get over your bad self. You've missed the message a long time. If you Y'all moved me out tonight. I don't care. I'll go sit with my wife. I'll take the long way around to get up here. Because it's a whole lot better with y'all here than not. We need to be careful what we taught our children. We need to be careful what we've personified in the house of God. It's his. You, you can oppose the pastor, but turn around. Oh, wait a second here. You can't, you can't have it one way. Let me seek the face of God, get my spirit right. It doesn't matter if I've esteemed some level of any place or record. I'm standing before God. Let me humble myself. Let me grab that anchor chain. Let me get closer to him right now. I don't want to just drive to church and sit here. Life's hard enough. And God's will often is not our will. We get confused. We get pulled in different situations. We recently had a death in our family. And the people that do not know God got mad. I learned something over the past couple of years. I watched people who went through stuff. You get mad at God when you're distant. You get mad when you're distant. You accuse God when you don't, when you're not anointed. You, oh yeah, I'm not saying it don't hurt, and I'm not saying the pain's not real, but you are taking out of God's hand what only belongs to Him, and you've put yourself in His seat. And you, I said it Sunday, you want to judge Him. Grab a hold of that prayer chain. Pull yourself close, God. He'll speak to you. He'll tell you. That's why he, Jesus told this parable. That's why he gave it to us. To understand that, 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 that God has good intentions and he's got goodness and love to give us. That we are always to pray and not to faint because God has some. The enemy, when the enemy tells the story, the shepherd's always at fault. Here's another way. When the wolf tells the story, the shepherd's always. I've run out of time. But if you follow this entire chapter through, I was telling Sister Crow about it on the way here. I could really have told you everything in a few moments, but you won't assimilate it that way. If you go through this entire chapter and follow it, I believe Jesus knew what was going to happen in a few moments. He tells another story right after this about two people going up to pray. Prayer is important, people. Talked about how one came to church and how the other came to church. Go read that. And be honest about which way you lean. Mm-hmm. Go, go read that. Benny talks about children coming to Jesus and the disciples, hey, wait, wait, get, get, get back. He's like, oh, no, 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 no. Hey, youngins. Oh, that's awesome. I don't care how young you are, how old you are, you can go to Jesus. In fact, the Bible says, set you be as come as a little child. Ooh. Jesus had suffered the little children to come unto me. Then a certain ruler comes to him. Lord, good master. How many come in here? Good master. I don't know if I want to be my master. That means he's in charge. But he says it. What, do I, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? What do I need to do? 
and he's got this great resume. And then Jesus gives him what he really needs and he didn't like it. Can I, can I tell you, sometimes you're going to get down and pray. You are not like what you're going to be told. But it's still what's best for you. Go read that part. That can help everybody. It's not spiritually healthy to become entangled with the things of this world, especially financially. It's a snare to humanity and it's pride. And the human, the, 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 the spirit of God will not survive in an in a arrogantly prideful person. In fact, it was so poignant that, that, that someone, who can be saved? He's talking to us. We're getting tr brutal truth here. And now you know why Jesus said in the story, she went to him day and night. I tell you, you'll be saved. Those people praying. And Peter chimes in to cover all of us, everyone here, who's given everything to serve God. Sarcasm. Lo, Jesus, we've left all to follow thee. And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, There is no man that hath left house or parents or brethren or wife or children for the kingdom of God's sake, who shall not receive manifold more in this present time and in the world to come life everlasting. What a beautiful answer. But this is what I wanted to get to because he ended. It ends this chapter with a gentleman we all know. He's the lowest on the totem pole, Sister Jess. He's probably homeless, penniless, kind of scrawny and skinny. He needs a bath. Jesus is surrounded by so many people that I think the disciples thought, you know what? You shut up. He's got enough to deal with. Look at all, look at all these wonderful people here. We don't need to worry about the blind Bartimaeuses. You hush. We don't want to hear from you. You're not, you can't get, you can't bring anything, get help Jesus in. You ain't got nothing. But he did something that many of us are too prideful to do. Because it's, 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 remember he talked about the finances. See, we got that, so we don't think we're blind Bartimaeus. But the Bible lets us know in Revelation, we don't know that we're poor, blind, and naked. We don't know that the sin of American opulence, what it's done to us spiritually. We don't think we need to pull our boat to that shore. I got a boat. And it shows this guy. And I believe Jesus knew I'm going to take them right by blind Bartimaeus because I know what he's going to teach us. I know what he's going to show us. That no matter your condition, no matter your position, no matter that if you'll cry out to God, yes. if you'll pray with desperation, Jesus, our son of David. You know, he prayed for the mercy, but got everything. Yes. I don't know what you need. But I, all, I know we all need to be closer to God. And isn't it interesting that when he cried out, Jesus stopped and said, bring him to me. They were all around him. But it's blind Bartimaeus that got his need met.